In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. My beloved, we are so excited to once again have this monthly Q&A where we give everyone the opportunity to be able to gather on the Facebook platform to ask their questions live, to get some answers if ever we know them, uh, and to have this like opportunity to be able to communicate with one another and to share and to learn together. And now, as you know, many of you have submitted many questions online. We are receiving those questions. Others are sending in their questions live during these platforms, which we're very happy to be able to offer to you guys. So please make sure to continue to send your questions so we can go ahead and uh, be inspired to see what videos we create, what we don't, and also like how to engage with you guys at the level that you guys want. So let's go ahead and begin right away. I see some people are already joining. Welcome, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, we'll go ahead and start answering a few questions from what we have already received in the past. And then uh, while this happens, obviously I encourage anyone who has any questions to please feel free to go ahead and ask them on the platform and we'll go ahead and answer those as best as we can. So we have a question that come in and I'll go ahead and share it with you guys. And the question says, sometimes I am slightly convinced in science that proves that God doesn't exist, but faith kind of holds me back from fully believing that he doesn't. Do you have any advice for me? So this is, this is a question that many of us are facing in today's secular world, right? It would almost seem as if there is an agenda behind the scientific community or some of the scientific community, to be fair, um, where some people are using science as the tool or the weapon to be able to disprove God. Almost as if to say that science is the anti-God, that if you are a person who's scientifically minded, that rationally, there's no way in your right mind that you should have any sort of faith in a deity. I want to tell you that that was never the case, that this is actually a very new movement in history. As a matter of fact, uh, for the longest time, science and philosophy always went hand in hand. And this is why the atheistic movement is actually not as old as we might think it is. For the longest of times, humanity has always been pursuing the God, that deity, the creator, the one who is greater than us, because we've always seen the fingerprint of God in everything we observe in the natural world. Now, what's interesting is that that's exactly what science is meant to be, the observation of things within the natural world, within the natural reality. Now, science is supposed to observe things and make conclusions based on those observations. What it is not supposed to do is answer questions that are outside the realm of observation, that are outside of the realm of what can be put empirically under the microscope. Now, here's what I'm trying to get at. Science is there to be able to help us answer the questions of what and how, while faith is supposed to be there to help us to answer the questions of who and why. And you see, those are two very different sets of questions. The what and the how are observable. And science is a gift from God to us to be able to find out things about that. And they ultimately always point back to a God that is greater than us, to an intelligent creator who created with purpose and with design. That it was not simply left up to something that is random or something that is chaotic. That there is actually beauty behind the purpose of creation. But you will never be able to understand that when observing the how and the what, unless you're also asking the questions of who and why. And this is what we believe faith is there for. The problem is when these two get mixed up. When the religious body of believers, the theologians, start to answer the questions of the what and the how, and the scientists who are trying to answer the questions of the who and the why. What we're doing here is that we're almost cross-contaminating the realities of these different faculties. You see, the problem is that scientists should stay within the realm of helping us understand the what and the how, and we should take their word, and we should take their professional observations and what they have done with the gifts that God has given them, and bring that into the light of Christ and see what it tells us, to allow ourselves to be influenced by this, to ask hard questions, and to see what it tells us about God. And at the same time, they should leave the questions of the who and the why up to the theologians. So the problem that we have is if science pits itself against God and says the purpose is to be able to disprove an intelligent creator, then you're, you're, you're stepping outside of your sandbox. That is no longer your reality, and you shouldn't have a say on those things. On the contrary, if we're being honest, 
no one is speaking about the tens of thousands of incredibly um, incredibly uh, intelligent and ingenious scientists out there who do believe in a God and they believe that they've got to know him better because of the observable science that they have looked at. Nobody's talking about that. I think the problem that we have is that we're very quick to go listen to these online debates between professor so-and-so and, and this, this religious uh, representative, this theologian, and we go and watch these debates and they go at it, and then everybody is left up to figuring out for, them, for themselves who won the debate. My beloved, I want to tell you, I think those debates are, are, are truly, they're, they're not edifying. I mean, if you're curious about the facts that they're presenting, by all means, go ahead. But to actually think that one person won the debate over the other, it's, it's honestly useless at that level. What we should be doing is studying the truth of Scripture, studying the truth that the early church has presented to the world, and also seeing what today's modern science is saying about certain things, and then going on our knees and praying to God and telling Him, Lord, enlighten us. Help us to understand these things. Science is not the enemy. Science is a gift that is given to us by God that points us in His direction. But only those who are open to asking the right questions within the right realities are those who are going to be able to see that. I hope that answers the question of the person who wrote it in, and thank you for writing it in. We do have a few questions who've come in, so this is exciting. I'll go ahead and get right into it here. So we have a question from Phil who says, what does it mean when Christ says, you must hate the world? Does he refer to sin in general or everything like education, food, marrying, etc.? Phil, very good question. So when he talks about hating the world, the world here that he speaks of, right, is something that we have to understand points to something greater than just what we understand to be the world today. So he's clearly not talking about the world in its literal form, right? Because he also talks about how it is that he has come to save the world, right? How can you hate something that you have come to save? Now, when he talks about hating the world, um, it's, it's very similar to that statement that we make at the end of the Catholic epistle, which says, do not love the things of this world, right? Uh, and all the things that are therein, for the things that are therein will perish, and so on and so forth, right? What we are really trying to say here, and what Christ is trying to portray to us, is that the things that are worldly are things that identify only to this fallen reality. You see, when we talk about how it is that we are sojourners in this world, in the liturgy, we make that proclamation. We say we're sojourners in this world. What are we really saying? Well, we're saying the same thing that the Lord said in the Gospel of John chapter 17. When he tells the Father, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you protect them, that you keep them from the evil one. We are not supposed to identify with the things of this world, with the things that are fallen, with the things that are corrupt, with this idea of being able to find our trust in riches, with being able to find our power when it comes to worldly means, with using our strength, with exploiting one another. All of these fallen ideologies are the things that pertain to this world. And this is why the Lord also says the prince of this world is coming. The ruler of this world is coming. This world that he is speaking of is the fallen corrupt reality. Not what he intended for us and for all of creation. So when you say, for instance, um, does it refer to sin in general or everything like education, food, marrying? We're supposed to also appreciate these things. We're supposed to appreciate education and knowledge because as rational creatures, created in the image and the likeness of God. Knowledge brings us closer to Him. It allows us to be able to express the beauty of who He is. Food is also a gift from God. And so is the, so is the same thing as marrying. Marrying, obviously, goes back to that very first statement that the Lord made in Genesis chapter 2, where He says, It is not good for a man to be alone, but I will make for him a helper that is comparable to him. All of these things are meant to be edifying, to lift us up, not to hold us down. Now, if I use education, food, and marriage, relationships, all of those things as a barrier between me and God, that becomes something that is worldly. But if I use them in their truest sense, as a gift given to us by God so we can go to Him, so we can attain salvation, then I am using it in the proper sense. So to hate the world is to hate those things that have been introduced that hold me down to the level of corruption. In the, the liturgy of St. Basil, in the prayer of reconciliation, we speak about how it is that the Lord created us in incorruption. O God, the great, the eternal, who created man in incorruption. But then death entered into the world through the envy of the devil. And the Lord, through his manifestation, destroyed these things, destroyed death. 
and he calls us to incorruption. So if we only stay at the level of being satisfied with the things that are corrupted, the things that are worldly, if you would allow, then this is the things that we're supposed to hate. Those are the things that we're supposed to reject. But on the contrary, if we take those things that are in the world and we offer them back to God liturgically, eucharistically, in thanksgiving, then what we're really doing is that we are taking those things that are corrupted and we are restoring them back to what they ought to be, the same way that the Lord Christ came and restored humanity back to what it ought to be. Phil, I hope that answers your question, Habib. We have a question from Sabu who says, what we can do to uplift declining Christianity in the USA and in Europe, can Orthodox Christianity be the answer? Of course, Sabu, of course, uh, definitely. I really do believe that our faith, our Christianity, the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of the Holy Trinity is the solution to such a broken world. It really is. And it's interesting to see how it is that we sometimes limit the gift of that faith, the gift of our Christianity, only at the level of passing out flyers, only at the level of making Facebook posts and, and, and tweeting verses or sayings. And my beloved, we, gotta, we have to transcend those things. For us to actually shine the light of Christ in a very dark world, it actually requires a true and sincere repentance on my part. You see, if I repent, if I actually allow the Holy Spirit to work in me, then not only will it lead to my salvation, but to the salvation of others. Now, some of you might have heard me say this before, but one of my, my favorite, favorite statements, a beautiful quote by an Eastern saint by the name of Seraphim of Seraph. He talks about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and its acquisition, its work within the human being. And he says, if one person acquires the spirit of peace, the Holy Spirit, a thousand souls around him will be saved. I want you to take the example of the great Pope Kirillus. I mean, we don't, we don't speak about the effect that this man has had on the church, but this man, we don't know this history, but it's so important for us to understand it. When he came into the church, the church was bruised. It was hurting. It was in so much difficulty. It was on the decline. The Coptic church was suffering from a very dark period. And this man who loved prayer, who knew God, who was truly a theologian in that right, not because he understood all of these theological doctrines and could explain them and debate them, even though he probably could, but because he was a theologian, because he saw God, he knew God. And because of this, his prayer life, his personal sanctification, led to the sanctification of the entire church. He renewed the church entirely. He reinvigorated it with the work of the Holy Spirit through his dedication. And this is what we ought to do. In a much smaller scale, you and I should pursue repentance. You and I should pursue the light of Christ so that it can shine within us and it can overflow into the world that's around us. So Sabu, when you ask the question, what can we do to uplift the declining Christian in the USA? Yes, of course, it's important to share the gospel. Absolutely, it's important to share and educate other people. But more importantly than that, we should not limit ourselves to only using our words. Our entire life should be an icon of the Holy Trinity. When people see us, they should wonder, what is special about this person? Why, why do they have this, this aura to them, this scent to them that is beautiful? Why do they have a light within them that I, I'm attracted to? And this is what we should be pursuing. We should be pursuing the capability of being able to inspire others. Inspire others through um, our sincere repentance, through the Holy Spirit that works in us. Sabu, I hope that answers your question just a little bit. Father Deacon Daniel asks, how do we safely speak out in defense of the faith without falling into arrogance and mindless arguing? Oh, my Lord, Father Deacon, this is something that I struggle with tremendously. Uh, and I will ask all of you to pray for me because honestly, it's, uh, it's very difficult. Uh, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you the traps that I have fallen into. Um, so this is me confessing to you all publicly. The traps that I have fallen into is that sometimes I find... I find reassurance in the knowledge that I have. I think that the few facts that I have memorized, the few, the few quotes that I like and that I share, that those things somehow add a value to me. I sometimes feel like because I have a certain level of knowledge, it's, it makes me feel as if I know better, as if I am better. 
And the problem is that I am trusting in that theory. And this is where it reminds me very much of the Gospel of St. Matthew. Um, the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 7 is one of the scariest chapters for me to read. Because in that chapter, it talks about how there are people who preached in His name. It talks about how people have healed the sick in His name. It talks about how it is that they cast demons in His name. But in the end days, in the end days, they will go to Him and His answer to them will be, I do not know you. And they will be, they, they will be astonished. How is it, Lord? We've done all of these things in your name. How do you not know us? And he says, assuredly, I don't know you. And I, and I really believe the interpretation of that passage is you've never known me. It's not the other way around. It's not that I haven't known him. I knew about him. I studied about him. I learned a few things about church history. I learned the doctrines. I read the books. I studied the fathers. I know the verses. But I don't know him. I know about him. I think my problem, Father Deacon, is that if I spent as much time in his presence, if I spent as much time in my prayer room, on my knees, with a candle that is lit in front of his icon, praying the Jesus prayer, asking for sincere repentance, asking for grace, asking for victory over these passions and these lusts and these addictions that have overtaken me, then I will know him truly. And if I know him truly, I will be humbled. If I have come into his presence truly, I will realize just how small I am. Not how worthless I am, because the more I know him, the more I know the value of the blood that he shed for me. So it's not about thinking that I'm worthless, but it's about recognizing how small I am. So that when I speak about him, it'll never be about me. It'll never be about what I know and how happy I am that I educated someone or that how happy I am that I won a debate or how happy I am that I proved the person wrong. It'll never be about my ego. It will always be about him who I know humbled me through his love. And the problem is that I must pray much more than I speak. And this is something that I'm asking everyone to pray for me for, to pray for me that I'm capable of praying so much more than I speak because God knows I speak way too much. Father Deacon, I, I hope, uh, I don't think I answered your question, but I hope that helps. Uh, Father Deacon has another question who says, a note on my question, I am seeing more and more people getting into mindless arguments online, though seeing themselves as pious defenders of the church. My beloved, I can't tell you how, how much I agree and how saddened I am by the reality that Father Deacon is speaking about. We have to be careful. Social media is not a place for theologians. And, I, and I'm going to say something, and please take this, take, this as, um, take this with a grain of salt. If it doesn't apply to you, it doesn't. If it does, please accept it humbly from me. To make the claim that you are a theologian, to act as if you know better than others and to go into these debates online, what are we really trying to do? If I sincerely cared about the person that I'm debating with, if it really was about their salvation, why wouldn't I private message them? Why wouldn't I call them and tell them, as your brother or as your sister, I'm worried for you and I'm praying for you. And I urge you, please read these things. And I urge you, please pray, uh, pray about this and this, and I will pray with you. But we're not doing that. We're not reaching out one-on-one -on -one and actually caring for one another. What we're really doing is entertaining a subject on a social platform. It's become a chat room, a place where people just shoot their ideas and nobody's listening to each other. Because while I'm reading your text, I'm already preparing what I'm going to reply to you, and I'm rewording it so that if anybody else reads it, they'll think that I know what I'm talking about. But this is dangerous, my brother. This is not the place to debate theology. Now, it's one thing for us to use the platform to share beautiful things, things that are inspiring, to share with one another things that are edifying, to get into these mindless debates that are really going in circles and not going anywhere, and nobody's willing to back down. What are we doing other than exposing our pride to one another? What are we doing other than showing that the body of Christ is divided over these very silly arguments? Again, Father Deacon, I agree with you entirely. Um, I think what I would do is that before I type anything, before I send anything, before I participate in anything, or even have an opinion about anything, take a moment and pray. If you are willing to pray for a few minutes before you type anything, either you will feel the conviction that there is no need to participate, or you will feel the conviction that if I really am worried about this person, that there is something that they're saying that is truly wrong, then you will feel the urge to want to private message them and tell them I'm concerned. 
and I have a love for you as your brother, as a Christian, and I have a care for you that I want to pray for you. And go ahead and do that privately. But to just let these things mindlessly happen and for people to get into arguments and for there to be a lot of like passive aggressive tones, <laughs> it's sometimes amusing to read them and it's so saddening at the same time. So I pray that we can, we can be a little bit more mindful of the fact of where is the Holy Trinity in all of this? Have we forgotten about him and made this about making a point, about principle? Lord have mercy. Uh, Mark has a question. He says, hello, Father. For the past year or so, I have really felt like leaving the Coptic Orthodox Church in my city. The Orthodox Church is... Uh, in America is something I have been considering going to, but I really love the Coptic Church in general and don't want to give up because I think that maybe God wants to use me in the church in my city. On the other hand, it has been very hard for me to enjoy my life in the church, and an anger towards the Coptic Church here has impacted my personal spiritual life as well. Do you have any advice? Should I keep attending my Coptic Church, or should I maybe go to a different church? Mark Habib, I... I I want you to know two things. I think it's very brave for you to ask this question publicly. And at the same time, uh, I want you to know that you're, you're not alone in being a person who is tempted to be upset at your mother, the Coptic Orthodox Church. And I think sometimes we mistake the church for the people who are in it and the systems and the routines and, and the culture that is found within the walls of that church. And I wanna tell you that those are things that are even felt at the level of people who are now serving the church. And what I want to tell you is that first and foremost, it's important for you to understand the grass is never greener on the other side. The problem, the problem is that I must ask myself the question, despite the fact that I am actually in pursuit of the faith, have I mistaken the Holy Church, the Bride of Christ, for the people who are in it and how they make me feel? And if that is the case, I think that's more an indication of the state of what I'm going through and not so much the church itself. And despite the fact that my community in that church can be a cause of pain to me, it can be a cause of frustration and resentment, it doesn't change the fact that I know that it says the truth. I know that I can find Christ there. I know that the Lord is working there. I must be a part of the solution. I must put my shoulder to the wheel and push so that I can move things in the right direction. And while I might not see the fruit of that, if I am simply the person who's planting a seed so that future generations can benefit from that, then I urge you to please turn to prayer. I urge you to turn to prayer and to ask the Lord, what is my role in all of this? Lord, what do you want me to do? You have to understand that a lot of people who have helped build the church have also been the, the people who have been hurt the most by the body of the church, by the people. And unfortunately, this has been the case for centuries. Now, you would think that because these are people who are wholeheartedly serving the church, that they would not see this dark side, that they would not be the target of this. But you have to remember who we're fighting against, Mark. We're not fighting against our brothers and sisters. We're not fighting against the church. What does St. Paul say? That the real war happens against what? Against principalities and dominions and dark forces and the spiritual realities that we can't see. The spiritual warfare that happens to come upon a person who wholeheartedly wants to serve the kingdom by serving the church, what do you think will happen other than a direct attack? So we must war against these things. We must turn to prayer and to ask God to give us strength. We must confess humbly to a father of confession and seek guidance. Mark Habib, this is obviously a much more loaded question. And I'm sure there's a lot of history there. Uh, I urge you, if ever you want to take this offline privately, message me. I'll be happy to share uh, a few things with you. And in the meantime, all of us who are in attendance can pray for our brother Mark that the Lord guides him in everything that he does. All right, my beloved. It seems as if we've answered the questions that have come in. I'm just going to take a look real quickly to see if I haven't forgotten anything. No, I think we've answered all the questions that have come in. So this is wonderful. In the meantime, maybe I'll answer one more question that we have received online. And if anybody has any final questions, we'll go ahead and answer those. Let me just pull it up here. So there's a question that says the following, and I think this is a question that comes up a lot in a lot of Q&As. It says, 
Why doesn't God just appear to us and to all people who don't believe in visions to help our unbelief? Why select certain people? Why doesn't what happened to St. Paul happen to all of us? So very good question. And I got to tell you, this is such an overrated reality. This whole idea of if only God appeared to me in my bedroom. Let's, let's, let's share a few examples of how this is not how it works. Okay. We oftentimes think that if just God appeared to me in my bedroom, for sure my life would change. I mean, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He appeared in my room. The wall opened up. A light came through. There was smoke and incense and like the sound of angels and like all of this stuff. And Christ appeared and there he is. And he's telling me, I want you to follow me. I love you. I love you. And we think that this is going to be the solution to our problem. My beloved, this is, this is slightly uh, silly of me to think in that way. And the reason that I say it's silly is because many people have come face to face with Christ. Many people have seen all that he is, and many have turned away. Think, for example, of in the Gospel of St. Matthew, that young rich man, that young rich man who came to him and who knew the commandments. And St. Mark in his Gospel talks about how it is that he looked at the young rich man and he loved him. Why? Because the young rich man came to him and told him, Lord, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And... and it answers, he, the Lord answers him and tells him, just follow the commandments, you know the commandments. And his answer is, I have followed all of them since a young age. And the Lord looked on him and loved him, says the evangelist St. Mark. He says, one thing you like, go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and come and carry your cross and follow me. And it says the young rich man did what? He walked away, he left him, and he did this sorrowfully. Why? Because he had great possessions. Because he wasn't ready to give up what he had. This is the problem. The problem is that despite the fact that I might see the Lord present on the altar, that I might be able to testify to two or three or four or five or 20 events in my life of how he really came through, who, how I know that God is there, either through my direct reality in my life or an indirect connection to other people who I've seen miraculous works in their lives. And despite all of these things, I am not ready to let go of my addictions, of my attachments, of my sins. I am unrepentant. Judas is the greatest example. Judas was chosen by him. Judas was called by the Lord to follow him. Judas cast out demons. You know in the gospel how it talks about how he sent them two by two. And they all came back telling him what? Lord, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Judas was one of those. Judas was one of those, and he heard the Lord Christ say, do not find joy in the fact that demons are cast out or that you have power and authority over demons, but rather rejoice in the fact that your names are written in the kingdom of heaven. Judas heard all of these things. He saw the raising of the poor dead girl. He saw the, the blind man receiving sight. He saw the Lord walking on water. He saw Lazarus being raised from the dead. He saw all of these things, and yet he was capable of still choosing his attachment to worldly affairs, to money, to power, than to choosing the Lord Christ. If the Lord were to appear to me right now, it would be a great blessing. It would also be terrifying. <laughs> Why do you? If the Lord appeared to me, that would be a pretty scary thing. So I'm happy. I'm happy that in my weakness, he knows where I am and he doesn't fully reveal himself to me. I pray that one day I'll get there. But in the meantime, I know that if he appears to me, that I would still struggle. It wouldn't solve all my problems because my problem is inside me. And so the solution can't be external. The solution can't be a God who appears to me in my bedroom. The world has to change from the inside out. It has to be a willful change to see. For the, if the world all cries out and says, Lord, we want to see you, done. But why would he appear to a person who doesn't want to see him? This is my issue. My issue is that I'm not ready to let go. My issue is that I'm still unrepentant. I hope that answers a little bit. I know it's, uh, it doesn't address it head on, but I hope at the very least that it gives some sort of insight. I will leave you with one last thought. For those of us who are truly searching for God, for those of us who really want to see Him, my beloved, I really want you to know that your Orthodox Church really believes what it prays. When we are at the altar, and you hear the congregation say, Amen, Amen, Amen. I believe, I believe, I believe. This is the prayer of the priest, forgive me. I believe, I believe, I believe. And I confess to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh 
of our Lord, our God, and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who took it from our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Virgin Mary. We really do believe that he is present with us on the altar. We really do believe that this is him. We believe that we're participating in his life. My beloved, this is not hocus pocus. This is not some sort of poetic, romantic reenactment of an event that happened 2,000 years ago. We really do believe in Emmanuel, God with us. For those of us who want the opening of our spiritual eyes to see him, then we must pray for it. But he is very much there. We believe in a Holy Spirit that is present everywhere and fills all. Isn't that what we pray? In the third hour prayer, we, we, we speak directly to the Holy Spirit. We say, O oh, Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who is present everywhere and fills all. Do I believe that? Do I believe that He is present everywhere? Do I believe that He fills all things? If I do, why am I not connecting? Is it because simply I can't see with these eyes, with this limitation of a sense? I must ask the Lord to open the eyes of my heart. I must ask Him to reveal Himself to me in a different way. And if I can do that, if I can turn to Him and tell Him, Lord, I really want Your light. Lord, I really want to see You. I know that You're present everywhere. I know that You're with me on the altar. I know that You even dwell in me. Then we will not search for Him to appear to us in our bedrooms. We won't search for Him to have some sort of d divine intervention and miraculous appearance that on the contrary, we will be satisfied with the confidence of knowing that He is with us everywhere that we go. This is the pursuit. These are the things that we should be actively running after. Not necessarily other things that we think will solve our problems. The problem is within me. And so I must ask Him to be within me and to help me fix those things that are broken. My beloved, I can't tell you how um, happy we are to be able to engage with you at this level, to have these live Q&As. It's always a blessing to spend uh, these half hours with you guys. Please, we ask for your prayers. We ask for your prayers because as you might have noticed that the project is growing. Uh, by the grace of God, Father Gabriel Wisa has been doing a tremendous job uh, by launching a new series called Deep Dive where we're studying the Gospel of St. John in great detail. And God bless Father Gabriel for all that he's doing and the detail that he's going into. It's really lovely. I urge you, if you have a chance, take a look at the Deep Dive videos. I thank all of the fathers uh, across North America and Egypt and Australia uh, who and, and England who have all agreed uh, to be able to allow us to use some of their things for the Words of Wisdom videos, those small snippets of two or three minutes um, that allow us to be able to share some of the beauty uh, of what they have said, how the, what the Holy Spirit has said through them. And we've done that in the Words of Wisdom videos, those small inspirational clips. Um, so keep praying for us. We're really hoping that this project reaches more people. We're praying that uh, somehow it's edifying to all those who participate. We ask for your prayers. We ask for your continuous support. Uh, and if if you know of anybody who can benefit, please share the content. We, we want to reach the end of the world. Whether they be Coptic Orthodox, whether they be Christian, non-Christian believers or non-believers, anybody that you believe can benefit from the Word of God, please go ahead and share it. Keep us in your prayers. To God be all glory now and forever, and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.